So, um, uh, so this is uh, the uh, follow-up on uh, the talk we had, uh, and uh, I thank Walid for suggesting that. So, uh, I think uh, uh, even if uh, the material is not yet uh, as ready as uh, in the previous sections. I thought, uh, I thought that it would be good to share these uh, speculations and thought I had on the current situation. Uh, so, so far we have seen, uh, if you want, two, two big epochs or phases. The first one roughly is from the 80s till the 90s, from 1982 till 1990, uh, which marked the chaos year of the civil war. And then we have seen, uh, uh, from 1990 till 2005, the post-war uh, period, or uh, the protracted civil war uh, period, uh, uh, which is the second part. Now, the first part, uh, which is the Baghdadi kind of, under the sign of Baghdadi part, uh, was uh, characterized by these uh, hectic uh, actions uh, points of reversal, a web of points of reversal, meaning uh, you have the different characters all the time shifting positions, uh, 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 and you have this uh, closing spiral, uh, which is the general form of the action, because all these hectic explosive actions, they do not uh, accumulate into a linear chronological time, but they just uh, close on themselves. Uh, uh, in, the, in the second uh, epoch, uh, which is 1990-2005, what you have seen is that the actual cut, which used to play on the surface between 1980 and 1990 in Baghdadi's movies, now is a vertical actual cut, uh, because now the war and all its... Uh, the war and all its... Uh, uh, all its uh, events and uh, difficulties just got uh, uh, repressed with the construction or the reconstruction uh, undertaken by Solidaire. So here the actual cut uh, became uh, uh, a cut that operates between the memories of war, the burden of war, and the kind of peaceful uh, new city that is being built uh, on the surface. So it's a kind of surface, in-depth actual cut. And when you do this kind of rupture, uh, the whole memories, weight, uh, misery uh, of the war is internalized and it starts to weigh. Uh, it starts to weigh and is carried by those who uh, carry it. And I think really, like, uh, in this period, uh, the paradigm of an, of an underworld, of an excessive materiality that drags us down because we carry all of this event uh, uh, in us, is the paradigm characterizing the post-war period, which is itself formatted by this uh, actual uh, vertical cut. Now, today, uh, now, the thing is a bit complex because after 2005, you had a little period of transition. Now, 2005 is, of course, the assassination of Hariri and the end of this uh, uh, project that uh, repressed all the memories of war uh, in the underground. And with the assassination of Hariri, 2005, uh, and the period between 2005 and 9 which uh, was uh, the extermination of the 14th of March uh, political group by the 8th of March political group. So it's like a mafia uh, extermination war. Uh, what happened is that uh, in these 2005-2008, uh, you had uh, a cut that ended the, uh, the Solidaire reconstruction project. And with the extermination of the 14th, you had this kind of establishment of more or less one power, which, un which is under the guidance of Hezbollah and his allies, uh, over the whole country. Now, so around 2008-9, what is installed is a kind of uh, forced state of peace, 
that actually uh, announces the end of the war, at least this is how I see it, uh, the end of the war, I mean, you have now one kind of winner, if you can call it like that, and he's like uh, the only power, military power and political real power uh, in uh, Lebanon. And uh, what happened is that since 2010 till the, uh, since the last two, ten, 10 years, till uh, 2020, uh, you have a progressive state of uh, degradation. Uh, what's interesting, or if you want to just pick symptoms, if you take uh, Tulayt Rehetkom and, uh, uh, and the social movements that marked the 2014, 15, uh, etc., they had a kind of uh, social claims like how to solve the garbage crisis, uh, how to solve uh, uh, issues related to uh, hospitalization, uh, university fees, so on and so forth. So the social kind of issues uh, re-emerge in this kind of state of uh, corrupted peace, if you can call it like that. And uh, this state of, uh, of peace slash corruption, uh, I think, lasted till the explosion. Uh, may I don't know, or I didn't uh, go into the whole speculation about who did the explosion and s things like that, but uh, I really think that uh, the explosion, at least in the official uh, version of it, was due to neglect and corruption and to the fact that you had tensions in the state of peace, in quote, uh, because the, no one could do anything. You had all these factions uh, as you can still see today on TV, uh, uh, which are squabbling, and hence to remove the nitrate, uh, some say it, it's Hezbollah who needs to remove it, some others say no, it's the army who has to remove it, some say you shouldn't remove it because uh, it's, the, it's owned by Hezbollah, so on and so forth. So at the end of the day, uh, the state of corruption makes it such that you have this uh, event, which is the port explosion, which is, I think, I think it at least, in the same line, I think it at least, uh, I think it at least in the same line of, uh, of let's say, the garbage crisis. Uh, the garbage crisis was also one of these crises where, due to the deadlock between uh, uh, the remnants or the residues of the Hariri power in Lebanon and the Hezbollah as a... Uh, uh, power, you have a deadlock that makes it such that uh, deals are difficult to turn into on the state government, which leads to uh, which leads to uh, uh, global disasters, if you can call them like that, which leads to like events which are felt on the level of the whole country, uh, the garbage crisis, and then the uh, explosion, and before it, the progressive degradation of economy, the electricity crisis, so on and so forth. Now, all of these crises, they overshadowed, I think, they overshadowed the post-war era kind of burning question. Uh, they overshadowed the fact that we just went out of war, and we have this uh, memory of the war hanging uh, uh, within us. And they really put on the on the floor the social uh, uh, social issues, bio biopolitical issues like how we can live here, how we can have clean water, how we can have uh, uh, spaces to uh, have leisure, uh, breathe clean air, so on and so forth. So, uh, so now uh, if you look at the Beirut explosion, for me it's an event. It's one event in this case which is hence triggered by the dysfunctionality of the state, of a state which is in a kind of corrupted uh, deadlock, all the parties opposing each other to get a piece of the cake. And this kind of deadlock of the state uh, is leading to these global events. So, um, uh, so, I'll do this. Uh, so this is uh, the Beirut explosion, and what interests me in this photo is that you see for the first time an explosion and you have all Beirut uh, related to the explosion. Now, if you contrast this explosion to the uh, usual car bomb explosion, usually the car bomb explosions used to be localized. Uh, it used to, they used to be first localized, and second, 
whatever is our take on the political agenda of those who used to do these car explosions, they, they used to be uh, carried by a political kind of discourse or agenda. This is why if you ask around your friends, you see, they tell you that when they heard the explosion, including myself, me, I thought it was uh, an attempt of assassination of John Blood because he lives uh, behind my building. And all those who at the beginning uh, felt the explosion, they thought it was targeting someone or a neighborhood uh, next to them. Well, actually, it was, uh, it was uh, a global kind of explosion. So this is why I have this picture where you saw that the explosion re relates now to the whole of uh, Beirut. And uh, its impact was really uh, a kind of uh, global destruction. A global destruction that you have seen uh, all over Beirut, uh, which led to a first kind of parallel, uh, first kind like a kind of parallel montage, a parallel montage where you see the explosion and how it is lived or experienced in the whole neighbor, in all kinds of neighborhoods, uh, uh, be it uh, if you want to take the old language on the eastern side or the western side of Beirut, be it in the neighborhoods. Uh, under Aoun or Hezbollah or under the uh, Hariri and his uh, allies. So uh, it's as if it's, you know, it, it's an explosion that doesn't take into consideration or it, di or it didn't take into consideration the usual sectarian partitioning of space and, uh, and hence it's this kind of global explosion, even though it's an explosion that didn't or haven't uh, led to a total destruction. So if you want, th these are for me the two kind of characteristic. It's a global explosion, but it didn't go to the point where you have a total destruction. Like in the case of, uh, of the carpet bombing that uh, happened in Europe. Uh, in Europe you had carpet bombing, which was like everything was uh, destroyed. And, uh, and when everything is destroyed, uh, as Deleuze puts it in his Cinema 2 book, uh, this is when you have optical art. Uh, and, and for me, this is, if you want, the shift in the modality of perception. I mean, after 2005 and the deadlock of the state, you had this progressive corrosion, destruction of the city. And this is why I think uh, in Lebanon we are moving, or what is being revealed is a kind of pop-up art uh, period uh, uh, that I will try to explain. Now, now what, what are the origins or the ways uh, pop art and, uh, and uh, uh, up art, uh, why do you have this? Uh, to explain that, uh, I need to go through a detour, which I hope won't be too long. Uh, practically put, uh, uh, the sensory motor organization is when you're able to act and feel and perceive in accordance to a concept and in a space or in a milieu that you understand. Uh, what I'm saying is very simple. Uh, remember the example of the cowboy and the Indian. Uh, you have a space which is organic and normal when when you see things you understand what they are. They give you feelings and you can act on accord of these feelings and all of that is uh, under the organization of the concept. So if you are in New York and you are having an organic life, you understand uh, what is a street, what is a sidewalk, you understand uh, what is a door. If you want to go inside a building, well, you turn the knob of the door, you open the door, you walk in the hallway, you see the staircase, you take the staircase, and all of these are what you call coordinated uh, movement. This is what you call the sensory motor organization because you understand your milieu and each image leads to an action which leads to a new perception, new action, emotion, so on and so forth. Now, what happens in situations of destruction, like the carpet bombing of Europe, uh, what happens is that you have uh, a milieu that you don't understand anymore. Uh, and you don't understand this uh, milieu anymore on many levels. First, visually, you don't know what to do in this milieu. You don't, you're unable anymore to read the street or you don't know where is the street, where is the rubble, how do you go inside a destroyed building? Uh, you don't really know anymore. There are no doors, no knobs, no staircases, so on and so forth. And hence you have a sensory motor disorganization. Uh, this is what uh, Doris says in Cinema 2. You have 
uh, Rossellini and the new way, uh, the new uh, neorealism uh, came out of the war because you had this situation where the only thing you can do is just look at the scenery and you're unable to act on the scenery. This is really, if you want, the, the, the fundamental experience that is going to ground. It's the fundamental experience that is going to ground the, uh, the optical uh, relation to, to things. So, on the one hand, when you are in a situation of uh, destruction, you're unable to act, you don't understand anymore the visual scenery you see, yeah, where is the door, where is the street, so on and so forth, and hence you have a problematic visual field. You have a visual field that you don't understand. And of course, what you don't understand, the gift that comes with it, is that you start seeing and just seeing. While when you used to understand, you don't see and just see, you see and you understand. So as simple as that. When you look at a door, you don't just look at the way the door looks, but you look at it as a door which is made to be open, so on and so forth. So, uh, so here the law says that in this kind of state of total destruction, things appear to be purely optical, and of course the sounds are now purely sonorous, and this is why you are uh, related to everything in a purely optical, uh, op-sonorous way, uh, which have seen the emergence of optical art as a consequence. Now, if you read a little bit of Vasarelli, uh, Vasarelli used to say, me in the beginning, meaning uh, before the experience of the Second War, so on and so forth, I used to paint uh, shapes, and I used to try to capture the essence of the pebbles, of the, of the shape of the pebbles. And you see, this is a kind of classical uh, mindset. I need to get through the shape to the meaning. But then he said, I thought that, w why get to the meaning and why bother with meaning and with all of these things? Uh, let's just paint shapes for the sake of them being shapes. And this is when you see, for example, the art of Vasarely, which is purely optical. Uh, purely optical meaning it just addresses to the eye and to, to the joy, to the, to the play that you can have with colors, shapes, uh, so on and so forth. Now, this is for the visual part. Uh, now, uh, this is from Sol Lewitt, uh, just to explain to you this paradigm of optical art. Uh, what happens with the war is that concepts also lose their meaning. Uh, meaning, uh, the concept, you know, before the war, uh, communism, the American dream, the French universalism, the completely distorted uh, vision of the German spirit, so on and so forth, uh, they used to give meaning to everything, and these uh, great ideologies, or great narrative, as we call them, they used to assign a meaning and give a meaning for each thing and for each behavior, so on and so forth. After the war, what happens is usually a loss of meaning, uh, which means that the words themselves don't have a meaning anymore. We don't know anymore what it means to be human, uh, if you take uh, uh, the war and its atrocities like uh, Auschwitz, uh, many thinkers like uh, Adorno, etc. They, they saw, uh, what does it mean to be human after that? Uh, you lose uh, you know, the meaning of the most basic words. And this is when not only your visual field becomes problematic, uh, it's also your uh, intellectual field that becomes problematic because you don't know anymore what it means to be civilized, what it means to be human, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, if you want another line of problematization is the conceptual line. So you have the visual line with optical art and you have the the serial art or the art of the series uh, that, for example, Sol Lewitt uh, represent. Now, what is a series? A series is when you have a problem or a problematic concept and you make images that are going to, uh, to reflect this uh, problem. Uh, so here, uh, what you see here is Sol Lewitt incomplete cube, uh, incomplete open cubes. And of course, where is the problematic here? It's the fact that the cube is not complete. Uh, if you have a complete cube, all what you will need to do is make a nice cube, which is as perfect as it can get, and this would be a classical way of relating to uh, the cube, because the concept of the cube would be reflected into the constructed image of the cube, 
and this is when you have this kind of uh, configuration. Now you have here an incomplete cube, meaning that the, the, the definition of the cube is problematic. Uh, we don't know what this cube is, uh, while a complete cube is we know what this cube is. So this is why you have a series, all the images are going to, to reflect the incompleteness of the cube that you see here and the combinations of uh, Sol uh, Lewitt. This is what you call a series, uh, serial art. And uh, Godard himself, uh, in many of his movies, uh, I think in all of his movies, had this kind of use of the seriality. And here I, think I took the example of the war, because uh, we're talking about war and civil war and stuff like that. And Godard's movie on the war, Le Petit Soldat, is a serial kind of movie. He, makes, he, makes, he constructs his movie with series, because for him, he addresses the war uh, in a question. He, he asks, not uh, war, not, it's not a war movie, but it's a war question mark movie. So, meaning Godard asks, or is asking, but yeah, wh what is war? Uh, what does war consist of? Now, this is when you have the series that he makes. So I'm going to show you a little bit of the series. So, what is war? Maybe war is to have airplanes, maybe war is to kill people, maybe war is this and that. And you have all these series that are going to uh, configure the uh, uh, the movie. Uh, I hope here you measure the difference between uh, Godard and Eisenstein. Eisenstein, he knows what war is and he's gonna cut uh, sequences in accordance to his knowledge uh, and uh, serving the purpose of, let's say, the Russian Revolution. And all of this creates an organic totality. Uh, with Godard, you have uh, something inorganic, something which is uh, problematic. And that's going to be uh, set like that. I'll show you a couple of images. Okay, so I hope you, you got the idea. You see these, uh, les cartons, meaning these uh, black screens with questions and sentences written on them. Uh, these are the problematic concepts that usually open the series of images. Uh, so, que font les soldats avant la guerre? What do soldiers do before uh, they are fighting? You see them supposedly training, and then you have all kinds of series. Uh, do so, uh, how do you steal... Uh, the booty of war, or what is the booty of war, you see then soldiers stealing booty of war, and these series are replying to the problem, or to the problematic concept, uh, uh, what is war? Uh, and uh, so you have series, uh, which is one of the forms of this uh, post-war uh, period, or periods of peace which are preceded by periods of war, usually you have this kind of uh, uh, artistic, aesthetical uh, organization. Mm, so, so, uh, so I'm saying this to, to go back to our context. Uh, to our context, I really think if you want to understand, or at least in my conceptuality, what is going on, uh, you have again, we have one event, you, ha you have one actual problem which is happening on the level now of the state, with the merger of the militia and the state, now you have one kind of uh, constant uh, uh, persisting event that is going to uh, provoke effects on the level of the whole country. Uh, so this is why I think the explosion is only one case. Uh, you have the inflation, the explosion, the garbage crisis, the... Uh, bank crisis, the uh, streets, the accidents that you see in the streets. Uh, I heard uh, that you had many people who died on different highways in Lebanon. Uh, 
uh, you have, for example, weird things going on, like students in different regions of Lebanon studying uh, outside their homes when, they, when there is electricity on uh, one of the street bubbles. So, so you have, of course, the problem of the medicine uh, related to cancer that touches uh, everyone, uh, so on and so forth. So what I'm trying to say is that when you have the merger of the, uh, of the uh, militia and the state, which is this kind of uh, sectarian total unity uh, that uh, we haven't seen uh, till now, that is happening on the level of the state, what you have is these uh, global events. I don't know what to call them, but it's one event, which is a real problem. And this real problem appears uh, over the whole territory. So it's a kind of dispersal of the event. This is why the parallel montage uh, is not a real parallel montage. Uh, for example, if you watch a classical movie, uh, when you do a parallel montage on New York, it's, it's because you want to you wanna show the different parts that contribute or that are uh, forming New York. Even though they are different, they all contribute to a unity, to an organic unity. Uh, what you see here with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the Beirut explosion or the garbage crisis, etc., or the bank, uh, uh, or the, how the people are reacting to the bank, like the case of Sally Hafiz, uh, what you see actually is, uh, is not a parallel montage that shows the, the unity of Lebanon, because this unity is not there, but what you see is a problem and a series. Uh, this is why I had to talk about the series on the problems, uh, meaning what you see is that you have one problematic uh, point, which is what's happening in the state, and then you see all the manifestation of that problem. Uh, so if you look at uh, Sally Hafez's case, so she was preceded by another one and another one. This is a series, a series replying to one problem, which is uh, the fact that the money is blocked in the banks. And what you see now on the level of action is on the right the emergence of the dramatic personal story uh, uh, fueling or informing the uh, spectacular action that is dealing with the problem of the money. So you had the sister of Sally Hafez, which uh, needed money to, to get her medicine, and her sister promised her to get the money. And why I'm talking about pop art and op art? And that because uh, Sally Hafez, she says in an interview, got inspired by Irhab wa Kabab, which is a kind of uh, popular movie about a guy who takes hostages to distribute kebab to everyone. Uh, and she got inspired by that in order to do the hold up for a personal story. But these are popular actions because they have a kind of popular uh, echo. Uh, yeah, she's supported by... Uh, all the, uh, all the Lebanese, uh, all the, uh, those who have money in the banks. So you end up having this kind of situation now. Uh, and it is mediatas. I think the other uh, really important side is that it goes into social media. It is a viral image. So the image is shared uh, thousands of times, so on and so forth. So the structure of the image is now in, this, in these logics of, the, of what we call the control society, aesthetics, or the uh, or the uh, op sonorous uh, kind of uh, aesthetics. Op sonorous covers uh, viral images too. I will not say exactly how and why, but uh, you're getting the idea. For example, here you see a daula, daula kila tahed baiti wa ana sirid bil matar bshufkom bi Istanbul. Actually, this was a false information to lure the state uh, agents to believe that she is already in Istanbul. Well, actually, at least this is the stories I got. Uh, well, actually, uh, she disguised herself uh, as a pregnant woman and she went out from her building while the cops were under the, the, the building. So, so you see all of this kind of now montage that is happening between the pop movie, the personal story, uh, uh, the fact that her story is also part of a series of stories. You had before her uh, the guy, uh, I forgot his name, of course, and another guy, actually, so on and so forth. So. So I see these as series, uh, as series and actions, which are pop actions that constitute these uh, series. Uh, if you want to make a contrast between the struggle during this, the 75, 82 years of the revolutionaries and uh, today, it's like the difference between this poster between, uh, from the Al-Muqama al and uh, Dog Day Afternoon. 
Uh, you can wonder what happened in, in between. Uh, what happened in between is that uh, during the heydays of the Mukama al Wataniya, which were filmed by uh, Baghdadi himself, uh, you had what uh, Mehdi Amil calls a party, a political party that is able to crystallize the views, the ideology, and the direction that uh, the people has to follow in order to win over Israel and the capitalists inside the country. But of course, this line was, uh, at least in the version of uh, Mehdi Amil, it was defeated in 82 uh, with the evacuation of the PLO. And uh, if you want, this was 7582, uh, or to be more precise, even 7577 was the heydays of this kind of uh, resistance. Today, you don't have this anymore. What you have is uh, sporadic actions uh, triggered by most of the time uh, personal issues or localized in personal problems and they target symbolically sometimes, sometimes effectively but without a kind of uh, popular, uh, clear uh, political oriented program, uh, they target uh, issues which are generated by the global event, uh, which are generated by this one event which is happening everywhere. Uh, for example, uh, uh, if you want to take uh, an image of that, it's a politician is in a restaurant and you go, you kick him out of the restaurant. Now, it's clear that this action has nothing of the Mokama Wataniya kind of action, but it is the politics we have today. Meaning it's a politics confronted with uh, the effect of a global event, mediatized because when you kick the, uh, the, the politician out, you film him, you shame him on social media, so on and so forth, mediatized by uh, social media, and most of the time triggered by uh, personal feelings of uh, indignation, uh, protest, without the presence of a political party. I'm not saying here that now we need a political party and because we don't have a political party, it's bad or good. Uh, I'm not going to this kind of speculation. I mean, I'm just dealing with uh, what is there. And what is there is this. What is there is a dramatic, popular, dramatic, dramatized pop actions occurring all over the territory because of the uh, global event. Uh, so, uh, if you want uh, another uh, another presentation of this idea of the global event, this is a movie by uh, Maisa, uh, Maisa Matu, which was. Uh, the moderator in the talk, uh, and uh, I thank her for sending me this uh, movie. And you see here, what Maisa did is that she started to film the dark uh, streets of Beirut. Uh, she started filming the dark streets of Beirut, and what's interesting is that uh, uh, you don't know exactly where you are in the beginning, and then Maisa starts to uh, uh, accumulate the screens. For me, this is uh, the series is getting built. She accumulates the screens, and then you have all of these streets starts to uh, compose each other in this kind of uh, uh, what we call uh, a kind of uh, mathematical uh, sublime. Uh, but I will not go into that. Meaning, you have different rhythms that you cannot synthesize anymore. And for me, this is really like uh, like uh, an image of the situation. Uh, I think this is, we understand that actually all these regions you see, all these little videos and the lights that you see, are filmed in the different uh, places of Beirut, meaning one is in Uza'i, the other one is in Hamra, Dahi, uh, Ashrafi, so on and so forth. So, and you see that now the darkness and the little lights, they they are the effect of the global event. They are the effect of the global event. And uh, on top of it, you have this effect of uh, uh, difficult synthesis to be made, meaning the mathematical sublime, as if you want the, the, the over layer of this aesthetical treatment, which is, I think, is quite accurate in relation to the uh, situation. So here, I'm, I'm just showing you, you know, uh, this is a different type of montage where you see one event uh, unfolded over the different uh, sections, over the different uh, parts. So this is a serial uh, treatment. Uh, so, 
So the, another series, uh, as you can remember, when the explosion happened, you had these people cleaning everywhere. Uh, this is for me also is, a, is another manifestation of the general problem. And uh, what I like with Marwan Rishmawi, uh, he had to have an ex he was having an exhibition, or uh, if I understood well, a programmed exhibition in Sphere Similar. And given the explosion, the, the gallery was destroyed, so he repeated the gesture of cleaning. And the exhibition itself consisted in a cleaned gallery. Uh, me, I like this uh, repetition. And here again, uh, here, uh, let's say the artwork itself is taken into this, uh, the same series of cleaning, uh, which is none of the left to a point of indiscernibility. So you don't know if these cubes are uh, just uh, a cleaned rubble or sculpture. So, so me, I like this kind of indiscernibility between the artistic sphere or pictorial space and the real space. So, you, or at least I think in this piece, uh, Marwan manages to, to, to have uh, blur, to blur the line between uh, the artistic kind of sphere and the uh, reality sphere. And you have also uh, the serial aspect uh, to it. Uh, this is another series uh, on the faces of those who were wounded by uh, the explosion. So again, uh, yeah, I'm saying, uh, I'm trying to say here is that uh, with a problem you have series, uh, to make it simple. Uh, now you have another uh, line. Uh, I know that Walid didn't paint them exactly on the, on the same time of the explosion, but for me, uh, and this is not the argument I'm trying to say, that he painted this from that. What I wanted to say is that the, here in the Spain is that since 2005, or to be more precise, 2008, uh, if we remove the Israeli 2006 war with the assassination period, uh, since the, the establishment of a peace statu quo in Lebanon, I think we entered materiality. Uh, I really think we entered an optical materiality. Now, what does it mean? Uh, uh, what it means is that, and I think I, uh, I take this more from, or uh, it's an interpretation of a text I read by Walid himself, is that uh, uh, the Hezbollah and the uh, future movement and peddling time while standing still, they really bring uh, our city to a, to a place where you cannot do anything anymore because either you need to wait for the time of the Ummah and the uh, victory over Israel, or you have to wait for the time of justice and knowing the truth uh, uh, that was at the time just after the assassination of Hariri, meaning we need to wait for the truth uh, of to know who killed Hariri before we can do anything in the city. Now, when you're unable to do anything in a space, if you want, this is conceptually, uh, at least it is how I think, as this is when the space becomes optical. Uh, now, the problem, of course, is that this opticality in Lebanon was not pro pro produced by total destruction and the kind of actual uh, uh, disorganization of, uh, of the city, but it was produced by the fact that the political deadlock makes it such that you're unable to act in the city, and hence the city itself becomes uh, the optical image of itself. Now, of course, since the assassination of uh, Hariri and everything that followed, uh, the conclusion of that movement, where you cannot do anything in the city, which applies also on, to a great extent on the political squabble itself, meaning you can't elect a president, you can't get this, you can't uh, remove the nitrate from the port, you can't uh, solve the problem of electricity because uh, you have so many... Um, interest clashes between uh, Saad al-Hariri and uh, Bastille and stuff like that. So you have all these, these problems, it makes it such that you live in this space which is as, as if it's an impenetrable image. And of course, the conclusion of that, I think, uh, it's worth what it's worth, I think the conclusion is that was the explosion. The explosion really came to show us uh, a, a kind of latent materiality which was there. And the explosion just came to put the clocks back uh, on time or to make uh, what the reality coincide with its own uh, manifestation. And uh, if you want to look at Beirut as it was uh, really, well, it is how uh, it, it was the way it looked after the explosion. Uh, even if it took 
10 years for this to unfold or to become uh, very clear. I think this is, uh, at least this is a reading that I have. So here, what you see is this kind of materiality or material optics, this is what I think uh, Walid does, is that you have two, two, two things. Uh, first, what really interests me is that it's not like Vazarelli, it's not pure optics. What you have is, at least, and I read this in many uh, commentators, so Bilal Khbez says it's uh, building with rubble. Uh, I think there's something similar. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm doing this uh, kind of... Uh, uh, forced, uh, obvious parallel. Uh, so there's something like building with rubber, there's something jumbled, but with all these material pieces, you can build a visual, optical, uh, uh, beautiful uh, uh, thing. Beauty here, because it's contained, It's uh, you, you look at all the different proportions, colors, uh, textures, uh, even the, the material, uh, the wood, so on and so forth. And uh, I think there's something of that. Now, the second point, uh, here you can see that I did it on purpose to, it's a rhetoric, rhetorical uh, move just to convince you that I'm right. You see, it's the same color and the same thing, but uh, it's not like that. Uh, so anyway, uh, so here you, you see really it's a composition with material. Uh, and uh, the colors I think here are really used, uh, not really as colored, but as uh, as as indicator to differentiate the texture, uh, which is different. Uh, uh, for example, this is uh, on the right is from Etel Adnan. It's a use of color as color uh, because she uses color in a way where she can contrast. And the whole paintings of uh, Etel Adnan is that they work on uh, minute uh, close contrast. Uh, and the color has function as color because uh, it contrasts with another color. Well, I think with Walid, the color uh, underlines an, an area most of the time. Uh, it follows the strictures of the structure. And uh, it's not that it's, it's just a contrast or its purpose is to work as a contrast. Uh, I also think that this kind of materiality, actuality of the painting I think that these paintings also include the shadow. Uh, there's a circular series where you have a little platform and you see the shadow the, under the platform. So I think uh, all of these uh, indices, or all of these ways of treating color, texture, material, uh, pushes me in thinking what Wally is doing as a material optic. Uh, when you do a material optic, what's interesting is that you see the materiality of the city. Uh, I think Walid wrote a lot about the materiality of the city, the excessive materiality of the city, and in earlier writing it was about how to build uh, this uh, uh, the labyrinth with all the fragments that we have, so on and so forth. And I really think that after 2010, uh, if you want, the new burning question is that indeed we live in a kind of uh, optical material place. We can't do anything about it and yet it's weighing uh, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's weighing and it's still there. Uh, the traces of the war are still there. Everything is still there, but it's as if it's, it was pacified. And uh, hence you have this uh, new paradigm, uh, and, and, uh, which is here. Uh, now, uh, you see also what Wally does is a series, uh, which is quite interesting for me. Uh, it's a series, meaning all the squares form a series, and I think the, the kind of aesthetical or even political problem being addressed is that it's as if you have one problem, uh, which is how to do something with the pieces, the material pieces, with the rubble if you want, uh, with the materiality of the city, and how to compose something with that. Which is again, and I think this is at least in my reading of Walid, which is again an affirmation and a transfiguration of what is there. Uh, which is uh, a position that at least I also adhere to, uh, uh, and uh, which is, uh, it's not a kind of, uh, you know, Lebanon is like that, it should, Lebanon is like this, but it should be like that, and hence you try, you start projecting all kinds of idealities on uh, Lebanon. No, here you really, uh, the problem I think here is to assess how things are, and I think the visual field, uh, determined as uh, optical materiality, a space where we can't do anything even though the space seems to, to look uh, more or less fine, at least until the explosion, is at least uh, in my reading uh, what this opens uh, up to. 
Uh, now, what's interesting here, if you really read uh, this kind of parallel, this is Ed Reinhardt. And Ed Reinhardt, after the war, used to say, for example, and today many artists like myself refuse to be involved in some ideas. In painting, for me, no fooling the eye, no window hole, so on and so forth. So, meaning the posture of Ed Reinhardt after the war, which is not uh, optical art, it's craft painting, craft painting, which is a subspecies of all of these practices, uh, is like we need, we don't have to convey ideas anymore, meaning you don't need anymore to convey the Russian ideal or the American dream or the nature of the pebble or the nature of the horse when you do an artwork. All what you need to do is just uh, show it as it is. Uh, and Ed Reinhardt used to do black squares, which are very well painted. This is all what he used to do, and it had absolutely no meaning, uh, no idea involved. Now, what I captured here, what uh, it's a sentence, I didn't find the sentence in the text, but apparently it's a sentence from Walid. Je ne veux pas que mes œuvres racontent une histoire, mais I don't want the works, the, the, the works that I showed you, some of them, uh, to, to tell a story, or to tell, maybe we should say, or I would say, the history of... And I think also this is part of this material opticality. Yeah? You live in a space which has lost its meaning. Yeah? And I think the loss of meaning occurred when all of this problem uh, just uh, overfled and overflowed uh, and uh, repressed the, uh, the, the, the questions that were raised in the 19, uh, 2005 uh, questions, and even which itself was an epoch that uh, covered the whole politically meaningful struggle of the 70s. So this is when you end up in a space which is, uh, uh, which doesn't, uh, which has a lot of history, but you feel that all that history is uh, meaningless, or at least it's, uh, it's emptied from its potency to provoke a change, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, this is, uh, so to, to, to move on and uh, conclude hopefully soon, uh, this is by uh, Raed Yassin, and what interests me is that in parallel with, uh, hence with serial art and optical art, uh, material optics, popular action, and uh, series, uh, as we have seen, uh, you have a tendency which is uh, pop art, like uh, literally the pop art. But what interests me in the work of Raed Yassin is that uh, his pop art is also material. In which sense? Uh, in the sense that that, of course, pop art came to back up the optical situation. Now, what does this mean? It means that when everything is destroyed and you don't have any more ideas and history and all of that, all of you have history, but it's not anymore mobilized as a political vector, uh, what happens in the first world, as we call it, what happens is that you have the, the, the advertisement, uh, Hollywood, uh, internet, all kinds of machines, uh, uh, the television, uh, so on and so forth, all kinds of machines that step into the place of ideology and the big ideas like American dream, uh, Russian uh, communism, so on and so forth. So the, 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 the advertisement or the consumerist kind of society uh, holds together with these images that become the new culture. So the new culture is pop and it's not anymore the values of the Republic or the values of the American dream. And uh, what I like in uh, Raid Yassin is that we too, of course, we're part of this uh, Western pop culture, uh, but the, the difference is that it's an imported culture. I think the main difference between uh, our pop culture as imported and the pop culture as produced, uh, where it is produced, is that uh, in the place where it is produced, uh, you can compare it to the real. So it becomes like, uh, you know, uh, so that if you watch a, a Hollywood movie and you live in the States, well, you know what New York looks like uh, outside of the movie. Uh, but for us, uh, you know, movies in New York, uh, if you, I've never been to New York t until today, well, 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 this is uh, New York. So you have this kind of merger between the imported image and the reality of the, uh, of the image, uh, which, which makes, uh, for example, uh, makes this kind of work, which interests me because these are images from Playboy, that apparently his dad, or in a fiction kind of story, his dad used to collect, but he used to collect them to, to draw, redraw on them dresses. So you have this kind of merger between an actual 
real kind of painting on an imported image and for or in the story that it says if i remember well when i went and i saw the show uh, you have this kind of uh, his uncle or uh, his uncle for example used to project these and live with these characters uh, 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 of uh, Playboy magazine or uh, porn movies, if I remember well, as if they are real, so as if he's living with these uh, images. And this is here another treatment where this boundary between uh, the actuality we live and the pictorial or image sphere is uh, blurred. And uh, this, if you want, uh, was uh, read uh, on his uh, Instagram. He collects this kind of images where the space of the image and the space of reality merged together. Uh, this image is the same. The space of reality, which is the guy, and the space of the image, which is the tattoo here, they become uh, indiscernible. And I think this is really like uh, one of the traits of this kind of art. For example, uh, if you take uh, Daniel Genadri's work, uh, this is from Beirut Explosion. Mm. This is what happened to the painting after the explosion. So the painting was restored. Uh, I'm just telling you now the story before analyzing the painting. So the story was, the, the painting was restored and Daniel renamed the painting after the restoration. So before the explosion it was called uh, The Glow and after the explosion it was called, uh, it's the same exact painting but now it's called uh, The Glow After the Blast. So, so anyway, so this is for the relation to, to that. So, so this painting for me uh, interests me because the, if you look at it inside the room, what glows inside the painting is the same exact thing as the light of the room. So actually when you look at these paintings, they have this power of presence, a kind of strong power of presence, because it's as if you see in the image uh, what you see on the wall. Uh, it's, it's the same white, it's the same light, but now in the image this kind of uh, ambient light of the room is uh, glowing. It reaches a higher intensity. And again, for me, material optics, uh, 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 even Sally Huff is how she makes out of herself a movie, which is the same as uh, Dog Day Afternoon or, uh, or Kebab or Erhab. Uh, you become your own image. Uh, and the city itself, which becomes its own image because you can't do anything about it. So for me, all of these, uh, they signal this kind of blurring or identification of the image and the real realm. Now, what's interesting in the work of Daniel is that these paintings, at least in my reading, uh, be, is a, so they allow you to, to cross the lines that separate the pictorial space and the real space, because it's the same light that is now transposed inside the, the, the light of the room, which is transposed inside of the painting. And what occurs is that when you see people walking in front of these paintings, well, it's, uh, they, they acquire this light and they become themselves quite present, at least for me. Uh, anyway, if you see pictures of people walking in front of this painting, you, you feel them uh, as if they're part uh, of the, uh, of the uh, painting. Um, so, uh, so maybe I'll show you that. So you can imagine how you see the people in the painting. So to conclude, I'll just say two words on the work of Miriam Boulos and the revolution. Uh, the revolution, uh, which I think was a moment where the, the, the Lebanese people as a unity was manifested. Uh, in this time of global event, of corruption, statu quo, something that looked like a piece but is not actually a piece, so on and so forth. I hope by, by now this idea that I'm trying to propose is more or less clear. Uh, during the revolution, what was quite interesting is that you had really a kind of mass uh, present uh, in the streets, in Tripoli, in Beirut, in suicide, so on and so forth. So the whole people went down. And what's, what I find interesting is that uh, they formed a body uh, a body of the mass without a concept. Now, what does it mean? It means that, if you remember the revolution at the beginning, they, they used to say it's beautiful. Uh, it's such a beautiful thing. And I think it's beautiful because if you take the concept of beauty by Kant, a beautiful thing is a, is a kind of unity of disparities, of different elements, 
and you don't understand how this unity is made. This is when something is beautiful. Right? So you have different textures and different uh, colors used as textures and different uh, nails and stitches, uh, if, uh, if you think about uh, Walid's uh, paintings, and they are beautiful, well, at least uh, this is what I say. They are beautiful because you have this kind of, you don't, you don't understand how there is an order, but there is a unity, but you don't understand from where this unity is coming from. Mm, uh, and so it's a kind of unity of pieces that don't really fit usually together. Uh, you don't need even have the plane of the contrast of colors that can function uh, smoothly to unify all the colors, like let's say in uh, a Tel Adnan's painting. What you have is that a color that is sometimes used uh, as a marker, next to it you have nails, so on and so forth. So I, I, I really, uh, if you want, uh, I don't think it's an analogy, I really think it's uh, structural. Uh, the Lebanese uh, revolution or upheavals, uh, they br it brought together all kinds of people, people who are politically divided. Uh, some people are followers of Hariri, others of uh, Hezbollah, others of Aoun, so on and so forth. This is one. And second, you have the different classes. I know that uh, they say, no, this was a popular upheaval. No, in the street, you had all the classes. Now, I'm not saying that revolutions are not made by the working class and so on and so forth, but in the streets, uh, which is a fact, uh, the sociology of these upheavals, you had uh, people from all the classes. Well, maybe not from the ruling class, which were usually kicked out, like the politicians, the ministers, uh, but you had a lot of people who were uh, also fully part of the, uh, if not the explicitly ruling class, of the, you know, uh, uh, banking class, uh, bourgeoisie, uh, upper class, which used to go in the street. So it had this uh, beauty because it was, uh, um, well, it was a unity without a concept. And for me, uh, the work of Miriam Boulos for me is meaningful uh, because she was able to capture the, really like the energies and the uh, relations and the specificities uh, of the people who were in the street. Uh, which means that, uh, and, f and what I think is that I'm always, I am always, until today, surprised by uh, these uh, images. Now, this is an older image, but I'm always surprised by these images uh, uh, of the revolution because, well, it doesn't look like the way I expected the revolution to look like, nor the way I expected the Lebanese people to look like. Yeah. And what I really think is important in the work of uh, Miriam Boulos is that uh, uh, she was able to capture, in my language, uh, the erotic unity of the bodies, of the flirtation, of the exhibition, of the sometimes people doing the show, uh, so on and so forth. And really, I think this was the life, or at least a part of the life of the revolution uh, back then. And the, uh, Miriam was able to capture all of these energies and all of these things which used to happen between the people uh, in the street. Now, this is another image prior to the revolution, but I'm, I'm showing you this just to show you that it's part of a pop culture. And uh, uh, while these images, I think, in the revolution are part of a pop culture with a kind of uh, bodily erotic component uh, to them, uh, uh, that shows uh, the unity of, of the body of the revolution. Uh, now, of course, uh, Miriam Booz was very, very like uh, uh, heavily attacked, like ferociously attacked. Uh, it was really nasty. I remember uh, back then uh, reading some of the posts. And for example, the attack was mainly on uh, how she makes people look as if all what they care about are looks. Uh, and uh, the problem of the money and to whom she sold her uh, pictures. Uh, this was really like the, the two lines of attack. Like she she makes look people as if they're only... Uh, eroticized, uh, show off, uh, you know, this kind of... Uh, so it is uh, judging people based on how they look. These are the Lebanese people. You want everyone to have had a plastic surgery. You want them to be skinny, perfect, uh, with what fucking money. Uh, 
so on and so forth and then it goes to the uh, fact that she told them to the time magazine and this is absolutely unforgivable unforgivable and so on and so forth so what i'm trying to say is that the critiques in their uh, 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 well thought of critiques if you can call them that, is a kind of uh, setting the moral uh, rule or standard to how or what should be done in a revolution, they really criticized the fact that uh, Miriam showed that one aspect of this uh, revolution is uh, uh, presence of bodies in a street, sometimes eroticized bodies, sometimes bodies who are doing the show off, so all kinds of uh, uh, pop uh, body art kind of uh, uh, dimensions which, of course, I think don't fit with our representation of the revolution and of the Lebanese people and of the, uh, uh, and of, um, the way revolution should be and stuff like that. So, but what I think is important is that at least she captured these energies uh, of this unity without a concept. Uh, until today, we didn't find the concept, actually, of the revolution. As you know, the... Uh, the deputies of change, uh, well, you know, they don't really have, as we say, a unified vision concept of what happened, uh, which is fine. This is how it is. So you have these kind of, so up till today, all what you have is a, is a manifestation of a, of a popular unity. Uh, they went down in the street, whoever they were. And uh, we have some documentation of this uh, unity without a concept, which is... Uh, people like uh, Miriam Bulos did, and uh, I would say, thank God they did it, you know, thank God they didn't wait until the end, uh, until next 10 years after the revolution to do something, after having well thought of what is the revolution and stuff like that, because I think, and here I take a concept uh, from Jalal Tufi, uh, which is uh, the, to accompany someone, uh, to, ac to, 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 to be the companion of an event, is one of the tasks of the of the art i think when an event happens of course you can you don't always have the, the neither the space nor time nor uh, freedom of mind to 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 do art and pictures and stuff like that but you know some events can be uh, accompanied by uh, and when you accompany these events and this is why i think it's very important when you accompany this event, you're able to transfigure these events. You're able to create uh, images, percepts, affects, uh, actets, meaning ways of acting, seeing, and feeling, that you bring out of this event. I think it's very important to, to do this work uh, in some events as they are unfolding, uh, if we can do that, uh, because this aesthetics, where you start seeing really what is going on in terms of aesthetics, I think these aesthetics, they prepare the concept. And uh, a genuine concept can only emerge from, uh, uh, from a situation that was aestheticized, meaning from a situation that was transfigured into percepts. And this transfiguration into percept make us see what is happening, and then you can produce concept, or at least it's one way to go. But I think this work of transfiguration is extremely important and uh, even on the political level because aesthetics can provide a unity without a concept too. Uh, and then the concept will come to provide a rational, well thought of uh, unity. The problem, I think, one of the problems of the revolution is that the whole aesthetical work, most of it, was repressed in the name of the concept, meaning we need a concept now, or in the name of pure action. Uh, just don't think, go down in the streets. So you have these two tendencies. Either you have to, you know, explain right here and right now why people are revolting, what is, uh, how Lebanon should be a communist, or make, uh, should Lebanon be an economically uh, communist kind of structure or capitalist, and you had all these ways before looking, I think, uh, minutely and carefully on the way people were relating to each other, uh, feeling, perceiving, acting, in this kind of collective body that was there. The body was there, uh, very few looked at it. Uh, very few looked at it uh, because uh, most were engaged in it, which is of course more than fine, but it doesn't mean that if you're engaged in it that now you have to shut your eyes, uh, f forget your camera and just uh, act in it or just think about it. Uh, 
which other two. And of course, you had this kind of critique of selling the pictures to Time magazine, which I think is a very uh, also nasty critique. Uh, uh, to go back to Godard, at least Godard used to say when his friends used to criticize him because he, he used to give lectures in Columbia University and stuff like that in the States, and he used to be highly paid. Uh, this time, uh, you're a communist, how come you can go to the States and get paid by these capitalist, uh, uh, you know, capitalist agents, agency institutions? Uh, Godard used to say, well, I, well, you know, you have to tax the capitalist. And the problem with capital is not when you get money out of him, but how he gets money out of you. Uh, at least, uh, so, so for me, the, the unfortunately, the critique uh, addressed to Miriam Boulos uh, and even later, after the explosion, so on and so forth, on uh, how we should not produce art now and stuff like that, I think it's just uh, a way to repress and to, to repress a form of art that can accompany the event. And when you repress these forms of art, well, uh, what happens is that you have neither. Uh, usually, you are without the concept and without the artistic uh, production. So, so, I hope this is more or less clear. This is how I think things, at least. I think that uh, aesthetics has a crucial role in its language, meaning it needs to speak the language of aesthetics. Is it uh, pop art, uh, op art? Is it a material pop? Uh, do you, can you use metaphor, no metaphor? so on and so forth. So really, this is like the language of uh, what I think is the language of art. And unfortunately, uh, this is to reply again to the question of Mesa, how what I do could be dangerous in any way. Well, it could be dangerous in just two ways. A positive way, because when you're able to get the energies of the Lebanese uh, upheavals or revolution, uh, well, you have a kind of specificity of the way these people do the revolution, which I think is extremely important, or else you end up just having the pictures of Che Guevara, you know, and stuff like that, which I think is very important to see the, the specificity of the way the Lebanese people revolted and constituted a collective body. Uh, so this is one. So you have a cultural specificity now that you can track, spot, talk about, because you have these uh, documents, uh, like the one produced by Miriam, for example. This is one. Second, if we take the work of Walid Sade on uh, the war, the protracted civil war, all the minute work he did on how we witness, how we look, uh, seeing by way of blindness, seeing by way of uh, death, you know, they have a whole plethora of minute description of the experience, meaning the aesthetics, the aesthetics as lived in the war. I think all of these descriptions allows you to capture a specificity, a specificity of the Lebanese uh, 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 culture uh, in the post-war era, the same applies on Baghdadi, but also Jalal Tufi, so on and so forth. And I think all these people, they really work on building a new culture. Uh, this is, uh, and, and it's relevant in that sense. It's relevant in the sense that you can, with this specific culture, fight against hegemonic culture, uh, be it coming, uh, if this culture is coming from the capitalist countries or the communist country, like in the USSR back then, or the imagery we have today of the revolution, so on and so forth. And it allows you to really like uh, carve a cultural space like that. So this is the first use of this kind of aesthetical theories to resist cultural domination. The second use of it is to unblock uh, artistic production by making people sensitive and making them uh, see that the artistic work is as such uh, relevant politically. It's not that, you know, uh, I'm relevant politically only if I manifest. This is, yeah, this is relevant politically without this transfiguration. And, and it's very fair and it doesn't, but it lasts the time of the action. I think there's another domain that doesn't need to be repressed, which is the domain of the transfiguration, meaning of turning this experience of manifesting, uh, revolting, uh, the experience of the explosion of Beirut, so on and so forth, into uh, artistic work. Uh, the thing, uh, uh, if you repress that, well, first it's, uh, it's a repression, uh, so it's not that uh, nice. And second, uh, well, you don't produce anything. You don't produce anything, and uh, well, when you don't produce anything, all what you have is a kind of moral, moral upper stance, and that's it. Uh, so this is why I think like this aesthetics is 
functions like that, uh, functions towards uh, production. Now, uh, th this is, if you want, the table that compares the three uh, epochs that I talked about. You had delirium in the war as a main uh, concept, the underworld and the underground in the post-war period, and the state of corruption in 2005. So uh, the actual cut today, you have one global event and you have a dispersal of the event all over the uh, territory. The vertical actual cut characterizes 1990 and 2005, and the horizontal actual cut, you know, when you have, it's like in Baghdadi's movie, all these hectic uh, reversals, which uh, characterize uh, war, uh, the war time. Um, the form of time, okay, I'll not go in it in detail, uh, stagnation and uh, of time during the war. The, the fact that we live in the past and in the present from 1990 to till 2005, and you have the time of degradation in the post uh, uh, today. You have today you have an anthropic time, meaning we live in a space where we just look at things uh, going in a degradation. Uh, uh, the form of narration, uh, you know, I will not cover it now, uh, if you take descriptions, uh, today what, what interests me, for example, in, during the war you had these objects that shift, uh, uh, you know, like uh, you use uh, a gun, uh, like uh, your neighbor becomes a militiaman and then he becomes your neighbor again. Uh, in the uh, 1990, in the post-war era, you had each object was really carrying with it the whole underground. So to describe it, if you want to describe the Holiday Inn, you have to add to the description all the atrocities of the war that happened with it. And today what we do is, this was really part of the speech of people. Huh? And today what is interesting is that we describe object functionally, meaning how to connect the motor to the battery, to and you have all these kind of uh, deviations of these objects. Um, I was talking to Ahmed Hussein last day, and he told me he's interested in that. And I find it really uh, symptomatic of our time, meaning how to use this to do that, uh, like uh, functional description. So I'll just move to the form of action um, uh, and the body. You had hectic actions in Baghdadi, you know, explosive actions, uh, they kidnap you, they, you escape the kidnapping, uh, you shoot at people, you go back home, you have a party, hectic action. Compare the actions during the, the 1990 war because you, your past makes you do things compulsively. Uh, for example, if you want to illustrate that, it's uh, Walid Rad, uh, Agent uh, 17. The guy used to live in East uh, Beirut, so he never seen the sea because of the war. So when the war was over, he goes and he becomes uh, an agent in the Lebanese army. And as an agent in the Lebanese army, he's supposed to film the spies on the Corniche. But given his war past, the fact that he used to live in East Beirut and never have seen the sea, he compulsively he films the sunset each time there's a sunset because he can't uh, he can't hold himself from doing that. I think compulsive action are really what uh, really like characterize uh, action in the post-war uh, era because your past comes and uh, makes you do things sometimes without you uh, wanting to do them. So they have a robotic kind of uh, uh, dimension to them. Today, you have pop actions. You have this dramatic, popular, uh, spectacular uh, thing you do, like uh, Sally Hafez, uh, mixed with movies, social media, uh, popular. You're the star or the hero of the day. So you have this kind of pop action. Uh, you see, these are different. Me, I'm interested in just uh, shedding the light on the differences between these different things. Uh, the body, to end, uh, the body is polymorphic uh, during the war because you have to go from one line to the other. Like the militia man we saw who, who dances while holding his doshka. Uh, like the character Abu Nubul where you see him navigate all the contradictions of the war situation. So sometimes he's funny, sometimes he's aggressive, sometimes he's a militia guy, sometimes he's a, a man who is in love. And he and his acting and in his even his bodily composition uh, uh, he, he, he's like that. He's something uh, of a snake, uh, of a chameleon uh, moving across all these lines. Uh, we have seen the weighted bodies, uh, 
and the clips I've showed you, the, the woman and the man, the woman testifying, uh, uh, witnessing or speaking about her rape, how it was uh, language and the body seems to be heavied by this uh, weight. The, the memory here is weighted. And we've seen the subtle bodies uh, uh, with Arbid, the movie where the guy says, I'm here, but I hear voices of the souls and I, go, I went to hell and I still live in hell. And this concept comes from Jalal Tufi, meaning to be here and there, you need a subtle body. Uh, and this, I think, characterizes the post-war uh, uh, era. Uh, today, you have the body image, I call it, which is a kind of merger between uh, uh, the body and its own image, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, the body and what it can generate uh, in terms of relations. We've seen erotic relations or tensions in the images of... Uh, of um, uh, um, uh, of Miriam Boulos, uh, you have the gender, uh, gender appropriation of the body, the body as a recorder, so on and so forth. So, so to conclude this time, really uh, for uh, for good. Uh, so me, I'm interesting, uh, interested in the different ontologies that you can get of out of that. So I'll just say it, or else it's going to be too painful. Um, uh, too, too long. Uh, so, uh, you see, a classical organization has this kind of ontological structure, which I will describe in briefly. Uh, you have the idea. Let's suppose you have the, the communist ideal. This is the idea. And then you have your concept, your concept of the idea. The way I conceive the communist ideal, for example, Eisenstein used to conceive the communist ideal as a dialectical movement. Uh, if you take uh, Vertov, used to conceive the dialectic, the, the communist ideal as a material interaction. So you can conceive the same ideal differently. Uh, so anyway, when you have your concept of some ideal, uh, let's suppose you're Eisenstein, you conceive the Russian Revolution as a as a dialectical movement, uh, meaning a movement that moves in terms of action, confrontation, new action, confrontation, so on and so forth. Uh, the negative is what makes the negative is what makes uh, things move. The negative meaning uh, misery, uh, oppression, so on and so forth. So uh, this is how uh, Eisenstein conceives it. So he has his concept, and his concept is going to give you a cinematic conception which is how he's going to cut his sequence. He's going to say, first we are going to see the matlots, and then we're going to see the misery event, which is uh, we want to make them eat rotten meat. So their negativity, so they're going to insurrect, they're going to win the boat, and then the boat will win Odessa, and then Odessa will win Russia, and then Russia will win the world. This is the movement uh, uh, of the concept. Now, of course, this conception is itself uh, differentiated into the images, and the images are integrated into the concept. Uh, uh, what does it mean is that, because I conceive the Russian Revolution like that, the images are going to specify exactly uh, how does the matlot look, when does he scream, and when we see these images, the concept get, gets richer, which leads you to a new sequence, so on and so forth. So I hope this is clear. Uh, to put it really simply, uh, you have the idea of the cube is the ideal cube, fine. Uh, it's the cube that the mathematicians talk about. Then you have the way you conceive this cube. It's a solid with uh, six equal faces, so on and so forth. And then you have the image of the cube. Now, of course, the image of the cube is the real cube, the cube that you make out of wood that you see, that you hold with your hand. Now, of course, the image of the cube is, uh, is never the ideal cube because you can never make the ideal in this world. So you have, in the classical, uh, in the classical kind of ontology, you always have this problem of the imperfection of the artwork. The artwork is never perfect. Well, it's never perfect because it can never incarnate the ideal. This is just to, 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 to underline that. So as you can see, this is how it works for classical cinema. If you take postmodern cinema in the first world, uh, what you have is uh, a power image concept. Uh, what does it mean? It means that if you take 
the optical images that you have seen, you don't have any more an idea like Ed Reinhardt said. Uh, all that you have is, uh, uh, for example, problematic points. And these problematic points, they express a power. For example, when your city is destroyed, yeah, you have lost your ideals. You don't know anymore if you're human, civilized, or so on and so forth. But this is when you start to see the power of the visual. I hope this is clear. You see, the problem with the classical structure, with the modern structure, is that it always represses, it covers, things as they are purely manifested in, in one of the powers. For example, the sensory motor organization, the fact that you just open the door, take the staircase, go uh, grab a taxi, this sequence makes you a little bit blind. Blind to what? To the way the door itself looks like. So I'll give you here an example from Heidegger, given that uh, we're there. Uh, Heidegger says, uh, as long as you're hammering with your hammer, you know the example, uh, you don't see the hammer. But when the hammer breaks, this is when you look at the hammer. Uh, this, is, this is what you call the apparition of the power of the visible. Meaning when things are not taken anymore into an ideal sensory slash sensory motor sequence, when they break up, uh, this is when you see them. Now, you see the thing. And uh, the visual as such, the opticality as such, is a power. Uh, not only, uh, it is a power, meaning when you see it, it's something that takes you. It's also, it has something mesmerizing and joyful in it. You just look at it without the meaning. So it's a power. Now, how to activate this power? You activate it by creating a kind of vortex of intensification between the images and the way you conceive them. Here's the diagram is not very correct. You have to put concept image, concept image, meaning you are going to create an artwork that is going to make you see the power even more. If you take Vasarelli, Vasarelli, of course, he conceived things, and then he made his image, but not to represent an idea. He made an image just to make you see the scene even more. I hope I'm being clear. In the painting of Vasarelli, your eyes are mesmerized, and uh, it makes you then look at things in a mesmerized way even more, and hence you create a mesmerizing painting even more, and hence you have this vortex of intensification. This is the ontology proposed by Nietzsche, by, by the way. Huh? So no more ideas, just powers, and the way to intensify the powers of life, as uh, Nietzsche calls them. Plato used to say, uh, not life, because life is a degraded image of of ideality which is the real reality so not life but the way life should conform to the idea this is a classical aesthetical uh, uh, ontological structure that uh, informs the aesthetics of the modern classical art this one is the uh, postmodern uh, ontology that informs the, the arts uh, uh, you know, up art, pop art, uh, Godard, and all these kind of uh, artists. Now, today, uh, what concerns us, I think the ontology can, uh, is proposed and can be, at least in my interpretation, uh, can be reconstructed uh, from the work of Jalal Tufi, uh, because I really think that the crux or the, the line that crosses all the epochs that you have seen is that you have uh, uh, we live in a manifest uh, dimension and you cross from the worldly to the unworldly, from the concept to the image, from the pictorial space to the real space, from civil to war, so on and so forth. So I'm trying to say is this uh, for our ontology uh, that I take from uh, Gerald Tufi, or this is my reading of it, this is my academic uh, reconstruction. Uh, this is what academicians or academic people do. Uh, we, I reconstruct. So, so, uh, so what does it mean? Uh, if you remember Baghdadi, Baghdadi you have uh, like you have one plane, and in it you start flipping from civil to war, war to civil, civil war for civil. So the actual cut is here. It's what's called here the threshold. And the actual cut in the 80s used to cut between civil and war, and you have this web of hectic action, and all of, this, all of it is taken into this uh, plane of manifestation. Uh, if you take the postmodern, beginning of the postmodern era, 
which we have seen two big phases of it, the 1990-2005 and 2010-2020. Both of them, I think, are also structured by this ontology because in the first one you have the unworldly is the underground, the memories, and it's actually cut with our everyday life. Uh, so you have this kind of superposition of these two dimensions in one character. This is, if you want, the, uh, the excessive materiality that weighs in each one of us, which was, I think, extensively and in very minute details and precision uh, theorized by uh, Walid Sadr. But also you have, as you have seen, the, fork, uh, the, the kind of fork tongue, uh, delirious speech, so on and so forth, which open on many dimensions. Uh, the fork tongue was theorized by Walid Sadr, and then the other dimensions that the war opens onto was uh, extensively and in great detail and uh, with all kinds of uh, examples uh, theorized by uh, Jalal Tufi, at least how I read it. Uh, if you remember the sentences I read you about uh, the guy reading, uh, explaining to his kid a mathematical how lines, parallel lines do not meet. And uh, the kid looks at the, at the rail uh, road, the, the rails, and he tells him, ah, oh, so this is, uh, so is this, uh, these two lines, hence, uh, are, uh, this, are we hence in eternity? Yeah. I, are we hence in infinity because parallel lines only meet in infinity? And when he looks at the rails which were parallel meeting, he says, that. for me, why is this important? Because you see, usually in Plato, you have the idea which is uh, two parallel lines only meet in infinity, and you have the images which are, uh, you never see parallel lines uh, meeting. Uh, but what interests me in this text of uh, Jalal Tufi is that now you take a mathematical idea, and it crosses, so if you put here idea instead of wordly, it crosses, or uh, unwordly, it doesn't matter, the, the, the idea which is, sorry, unwordly, it crosses into the wordly. And I think the texts of Jalal uh, are really structured, m many of them are structured like that, even when they are aphorism, is how to make two dimensions, uh, 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 swirl, curve, uh, communicate with each other, meaning how to cross the threshold from one to the uh, other dimension. Uh, so I said, Maroon Baghdadi's movie are structured between the, the actual cut threshold uh, civil war, and then you had the weighted body, meaning the memories of atrocities and the civilian uh, peace, and also in Jalal's the crossing of the, the many dimensions. Uh, the, you have the, the dimension of the imaginal, you have the dimension of the undead, you have the dimension of uh, of um, the dance dimension, which is itself a dimension that crosses dimensions, so on and so forth. And today I think we have a paradigm where you have a blurring or an actual cut between the, the, the real and its own image, which is what I try to call uh, material optics, uh, popular dramatic action, and uh, the work of also Daniel Ginadri, the pure presence as a crossing or a merging of the uh, light present inside the room and the light of the, the painting, so on and so on. And even the pop art of uh, Ray Yassin, where you see this kind of uh, figures or images which are uh, taken as if they are real, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, for me, uh, so this ontology, at least for me, is quite important because this is what I do uh, usually. And uh, it allows us to see that, uh, you know, uh, the concept and the image will not relate anymore uh, in, the same, uh, uh, in the same way. I mean, concept and image become two parts, two sections taken in the same plane and where the living movement needs to go from one section to the other by crossing the threshold and circulating between these uh, sections. It's not a movement of intensification per se, it no, doesn't reveal a power, but it reveals a plane of manifestation, and it doesn't reveal ideas, because uh, what is really at stake, even if sometimes ideas and powers are embedded into the structure, what is really at stake is the circulation between the different uh, dimensions. Uh, and I really think this is what, uh, uh, at least I can get from the uh, Lebanese aesthetics. So, thank you. I was long, as usual, and uh, well, this is all I had to say on that. Uh, 
is all I had to say and uh, this is why I stopped last time because I thought it would be too long and uh, so that's it for the talks uh, and thank you for your patience so I still need no mm. to end the show